us what we can learn from Gaussian models of data. Take it away. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this very interesting workshop. So broadly speaking, today I'm going to talk about the interplay between data structure and uh, machine learning performances. And uh, in particular, I will try to uh, shed some lights on what we can learn from uh, Gaussian models of data. So, uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, to start with, uh, as we all know, the great success of uh, deep learning can be mainly ascribed to two distinct factors. On one side, uh, the design of efficient uh, learning uh, algorithms and architectures, uh, while on the other side, the increasingly higher amount of uh, data uh, at disposal. However, up to this point, lots of efforts have been devoted in trying to understand uh, the role played by both uh, um, architectures and algorithms, but very few has been done concerning data. This actually started becoming uh, quite an odd topic within the machine learning community, as also uh, this workshop uh, testify. And indeed, uh, quite recently, Andrew and G posted uh, this tweet, where he basically started wondering uh, whether it wouldn't be the case to uh, actually start pushing both researchers and company to work on data while keeping architectures uh, and algorithms fixed, rather than doing this oppo the opposite. So why is this the case? Well, actually because um, data play a central role in machine learning applications. However, if you look at the early statistical uh, physics works uh, in the field, uh, like the seminal paper by Gardner and Derrida, you will easily realize that despite uh, these works managed to capture several aspects uh, of learning, they completely ignore the role played by data. So basically data are considered to be unstructured and sampled identically and independently from um, a Gaussian distribution. However, we know that in machine learning application, real data sets are instead uh, structured. And it is precisely this structure that a machine learning model tries to grasp in order to learn how to generalize well on previously unseen data. Now, quite recently, there has been a huge activity within the statistical physics community where we basically try to extend the previous statistical physics works in such a way to start including data structure into the game. Up to the point, we now manage to deal with data that are drawn either from a single Gaussian or from mixtures of Gaussian, but with non-trivial means and uh, covariances. Okay, so despite we know that real-world datasets uh, are not Gaussian distributed, given this recent advancement uh, in uh, statistical physics theory, and in particular the, the replica method, one may still uh, ask uh, himself, uh, can, I mean, there are, are there machine learning settings where basically Gaussian data models can exactly describe the behavior of machine learning models uh, when trained uh, in real world uh, data set scenarios? And moreover, even if they do not, can we still learn something from uh, Gaussian data models? So, to start with the first question, it turns out that there are indeed some uh, learning settings where the machine learning model is completely blind to the fine details of the input uh, data distribution. What it just cares is about the first moments of the distribution itself. This is, for instance, the case of uh, the example I'm going to show you on uh, uh, these slides. Uh, and that I'm basically going to discuss in the next couple of slides, um, which basically corresponds to the case uh, of uh, a data set where the input data points uh, are basically drawn from uh, a mixture of k different Gaussians. And the labels are completely random in the sense that they are not correlated at all with the input data distribution. 
Now, this data set defines a task which is uh, well known in a machine learning application, and that goes under the name of uh, storage uh, capacity problem. So, um, in this task, we basically uh, take a um, machine learning model that in the specific example of these slides, I will consider to be a single layer uh, neural network. And then once you have this model, the goal is to train the model in such a way to be able to fit some randomly labeled examples with a given uh, training loss plus L2 regularization. Now, the model, the setting that I'm basically analyzing in these slides can be analytically uh, solved. And by analytically solved, I mean that we can actually exactly compute the training loss with the replica method in the high dimensional uh, regime and express then this training loss as a function of simple scalar quantities plus some uh, uh, parameters that characterize the input data distribution. Now, if you do that um, and you compute actually this quantity, with this computation, what we realize is that there are actually some Gaussian universalities that go uh, around, and in particular, a Gaussian universality at finite regularization, which is well summarized by uh, the following theorem. So, if the loss is symmetric, which is basically uh, not such a strict requirement because basically almost all losses employed in machine learning uh, use basically this requirement. And uh, if the Gaussian mixture is homogeneous in the sense that all the different modes of the mixture share precisely the same covariance matrix uh, uh, omega, then the training loss of a mixture of homogeneous Gaussian is equivalent to the training loss that you would get by approximating the homogeneous Gaussian mixture with a single Gaussian but with matching a covariance omega. Is that clear? Are there any questions up to this point? Okay, cool. So, the proof of this theorem can actually be found uh, in the paper, but uh, actually this result can be further confirmed by uh, numerical experiments. So to see that, what you could do is to basically take a single layer neural network and train it with a, a mixture of uh, uh, Gaussians with random labels. And then you can actually measure the training loss as a function of the size of the training set. So if you do that, you will get precisely these orange dot points that I'm showing you here on uh, these three different plots. The solid black line instead corresponds precisely to the theoretical predictions that we get from the uh, replica theory by approximating the homogeneous Gaussian mixture with a single Gaussian of matching covariances. So, as you can see, there is a perfect agreement between what the theory predicts and the numerical simulation, which further basically corroborates the idea that there exists this Gaussian uh, universality and that in the end what the model is actually observing uh, is not a mixture of homogeneous Gaussian but a single Gaussian with matching covariance, okay? Now, once we have basically observed this behavior, what we wanted to check was whether this sort of universality can actually pop out even when we basically consider real world data sets, okay? So to do that, what we did was the, the following experiment. So you can basically take the real data sets of your choice, for instance, uh, MNIST, Fashion MNIST, uh, Cypher 10, or Tiny ImageNet. And you repeat precisely the same experiment. So you take your single layer neural network, you train it on the input data points of one of these real data sets, and then you measure the training loss as a function of the size of the training set, okay? If you do that, once again, you will get these colored points that I'm showing you here on, uh, on this matrix of plots. The solid black line instead once again corresponds to the theoretical prediction of the uh, replica theory that is basically obtained by approximating the true underlying distribution of 
all these real data sets with a single Gaussian whose covariance matrix precisely correspond to the uh, empirical covariance of the specific data set. Okay, um, is that clear or are there questions? Okay, so if you see, uh, there is already quite a good agreement between the simulations and the theoretical prediction. And indeed, when I actually saw this agreement, I had to <laughs> rerun the simulations several times just to convince myself that there were no mistakes uh, going around. But despite the agreement is quite good, you can still observe some deviations from uh, the Gaussian universality. So if you see, there are some contexts in which, for instance, uh, the, the agreement is still not perfect. So here, the central question is um, actually why we are actually observing these deviations. Well, if you remember, one of the main assumptions of the theorem was that the Gaussian mixture, the different modes, needs to be homogeneous. However, if you actually take uh, a real data set, like for instance, the Cypher 10 uh, in these slides, and you actually plot the covariance matrices of the different modes, for instance, here the three, three different modes of Cypher 10, you will easily realize that the, the structure of the covariance matrix is far from being homogeneous. So the, the modes are pretty different between, uh, between each other. So this is what is actually causing uh, the deviations from uh, the, the universality in real world data set. But Actually, what it turns out uh, is that uh, if uh, instead of considering the real data sets as they are, you actually pre-process your data sets with uh, some transformation, for instance, either random feature or wavelet uh, scattering transform, then the covariance matrices uh, becomes more homogeneous than what they were in the very beginning. And if you now, rerun the simulations after having applied uh, this preprocessing, then you actually will get now a very perfect match. So what this is basically suggesting you is that if you basically train shallow neural networks with random labels and apply this sort of uh, preprocessing, what the learning model is observing it just, and is trying basically to learn from data is just the covariance matrix, so the second moment. Is that clear or are there any questions? Yes, please. So nobody really changed the yes. 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 So still the same results obtained? Yeah, exactly. So if you, I mean, what we did here in the simulation was to first pre-process the data set by standardizing, which is, I didn't mention it because of course it's a standard uh, practice that you typically do. But if you also apply this further transformation, then you get a better agreement because basically these transformation are making your covariance matrices more homogeneous. And so you are basically, um, um, let's say, satisfying the assumption of the of the theorem. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, one, yes. one clarification, so these are sure. all the training losses still? Yes. Plots? Yeah, these are the training losses, uh, for instance, the square, logistic, or hinge, as a function of the size of the training set, and here the different lines correspond to different regularization strength. Because if you remember at the very beginning, uh, I was inserting in the, model, in the model an L2 regularization. And so lambda here is the strength of the L2 regularization. But, but if you saw some other metric, like generalization error, or other, other uh, evaluation no, metrics, we you just the saw, picture, we just saw the training loss because with random labels, uh, I mean, generalization uh, cannot be defined. But uh, actually, I will have generalization <laughs> after. When you planted models. Sure. Okay, so, um, okay, but however, this is not yet the end of the story concerning the strict uh, Gaussian universality, because um, it turns out that there is a second type of Gaussian universality that it is indeed much stronger 
with respect to the, the previous one, uh, that you basically get in the zero regularization limit, and that is basically well summarized by this second theorem. So this theorem basically states that uh, in the random label settings, under the same assumption of the previous three theorem, so symmetric loss and homogeneous uh, covariance matrices, if the optimization problem is convex and the data covariance is full rank, then the trading loss of an homogeneous mixture of Gaussian does not uh, even depend on the covariance matrix is itself. So if you run once again the, the simulations, you will easily realize, because actually we can run and repeat exactly the same experiment, measuring the training loss as a function of the size of the training set uh, in the limit of zero regularization for different data sets. And what you will actually observe is that all these data sets, so all the learning curves associated to all these different real data sets, they all collapse on the same curve. So not only the interpolation threshold is the same, but also the full learning curve. And the learning curve on which all these data models are actually collapsing corresponds to the one of completely unstructured data. So there is this much stronger type of universality that basically tells you that in the zero regularization limit, not even the covariance matrix matters. Okay? So going back to our central question, can Gaussian data models exactly describe the behavior of real world data sets? Well, yes and no. I show you that there are some settings uh, in which this actually um, appears, uh, uh, but I mean, it's not the full story because not for all machine learning settings, uh, this is the case. So going to the second question, even if there are some machine learning settings where you, can, you can't actually identify some strict Gaussian universality, can we still learn something from Gaussian uh, data models? Because maybe they are actually well approximating uh, in a qualitative way the, the behavior of the, of the machine learning model. So to um, basically shed, uh, give you some intuitions uh, about, about that, I will uh, basically um, um, talk about three different examples of Gaussian models that uh, actually turns out to be useful for understanding uh, some interesting uh, machine learning settings. And um, the first one is the so-called uh, correlated uh, hidden manifold model that actually turns out to be uh, very powerful for uh, uh, actually start understanding uh, something uh, about transfer learning. The, um, the second model is the mean field uh, generalized pots, which turned out to be uh, extremely useful for start approaching self-supervised learning tasks and in particular transformers. The third model is instead the, the teacher mixture model, which basically allowed us to start approaching the thorny issue of uh, fairness uh, in a machine learning problem. Now, this uh, let's say third model is extremely simple. It's simply a mixture of Gaussian with the labels provided by a teacher vector. But um, unfortunately, I mean, for time constraint and for the purpose of uh, this talk, I'm not going to talk uh, about this. I will um, specifically, um, let's say, focus on uh, the first two models. So the correlated uh, hidden manifold model and the mean field uh, generalized spots. But before doing that, uh, let me give you some, let's say, motivation of why these two settings, transfer learning and self-supervised, are so important and why we actually devoted so much efforts in the design Gaussian models of data to better investigate this sort of, uh, of framework, okay? So, basically, as we all know, deep learning uh, is intrinsically data hungry in the sense that it requires lots of data to uh, actually generalize well on previously unseen examples. However, if you think about it, there are some settings where actually collecting huge amounts of labeled data is simply impracticable. For instance, in healthcare, one should think to design a pool of medical experts which can actually label each single frame of each single patient medical examination. And this, of course, is a cost in terms of both time and money. 
So a possible solution which can consistently mitigate the, the need of new labeled data is transfer learning. This is a deep learning technique that is based on the idea that the generalization performances of a neural network that has to be trained on a data scarce target task can be consistently improved by exploiting the knowledge that a second network has previously acquired on a related but data abundant source task. So the typical transfer learning pipeline uh, occurs in the following way. You first train a network A on the source task. Then all those, feed, all those layers which are actually responsible for feature extraction are transferred to a second network, the network B, that is then trained on the data scarce target task while keeping the transfer feature map frozen and letting just the very last layer to readapt to the target set. Now, deep learning prediction is typically further at the stage of uh, uh, fine tuning where they basically unlock the transfer feature map and then retrain the entire network on the target set. Now, despite being uh, actually widely used in uh, deep learning applications, uh, uh, transfer learning uh, still remains poorly understood from uh, a theoretical point of view. And indeed, there are several questions that still remain open. For instance, uh, how related do the source and the target task uh, needs to be? Now, in this work, what we basically did was to propose uh, the correlated hidden manifold model as a model for structured and correlated datasets, where basically the correlations between the source and the target set appears explicitly and are directly tunable. Okay? This basically allowed us to explore several transfer learning settings and therefore to delineate the boundaries of uh, transfer learning effectiveness. Now, as the name itself uh, suggests, uh, the building block of the correlated uh, hidden manifold model is the hidden manifold model itself. This is a model that has been proposed by Sebastian Gold and collaborators in 2019. And it is basically based on the evidence that uh, real world datasets do not span uniformly the entire input space, but they are rather confined in a lower dimensional manifold. So according to this model, each input X is constructed as a nonlinear combination of some Gaussian coefficient C times some generative features uh, F. And here L is precisely the size, the dimension of the lower dimensional manifold, so the intrinsic dimension of your data set, if you want. Then um, the C can therefore be interpreted as the lower dimensional representation of the X of the input data points in the feature space, okay? The labels are instead provided by a teacher vector theta that directly act on the Gaussian uh, coefficient C, so on the laden space. So you could think to this model uh, as one, I mean, as behaving along the lines of modern generative uh, models that basically starting from uh, latent Gaussian variables then can generate uh, high dimensional uh, inputs as much as you want. Okay. Are there any questions up to this point? Okay, perfect. So there is a salient trait in the hidden manifold model, that is that it basically provides a direct access to the generative features, the teacher vector, and uh, the intrinsic dimension of the, of the data set. So in the correlated uh, hidden manifold model, what we did was to exploit this trait, and in particular, we constructed the source task as a standard uh, hidden manifold model, while the target task is constructed uh, from the source task by applying uh, three different types of uh, manipulation on the generative features, on the teacher vector, and on the intrinsic dimension of the data set. So the first one is feature perturbation and substitution, the second one addition or deletion, and the third one teacher perturbation. So keep in mind that all these transformations are actually meant to describe the situations which can concretely occur when you train machine learning models on real world data sets. For instance, teacher perturbation would correspond to the case where you have basically two data sets and these data sets are sharing a common set of uh, inputs, but they are labeled according to different labeling rules. Okay. 
So given this data model, uh, we consider then the following uh, transfer learning setting, where we basically took a two-layer neural network that we trained numerically on the source task. Then we basically took the first layer weights and we transferred them to a second layer neural network that has to be trained on the target set. And uh, it is trained on the target set while keeping the first layer weights frozen and letting just the second layer to readapt to the target set. We call this model the transfer feature model. Okay, and the goal that this model has to achieve is basically to reach the lowest possible generalization error on the target set by performing some empirical risk minimization over an L2 regularized logistic loss. Now, once again, this model plus the correlated the hidden manifold model can be solved analytically thanks to the recent advancement in statistical physics to include data structure that I was mentioning you at the, at the very beginning. And if you actually solve this model that is computing through the replica uh, theory, the generalization error, you will realize that some Gaussian universality appears also in transfer learning, even if they are less strict uh, than the one that I was showing you in the very first uh, example. And to see that, you can actually consider the following experiment. So you take basically the MNIST letters dataset, which is simply a dataset of uh, handwritten letters, and you just consider a subset of these letters. Then the source task is constructed by dividing this subset into two distinct groups, assigning to each one of these groups a different label, just because we wanted to deal with binary classification tasks. Okay, and then the target task is constructed from the source task by simply substituting one letter per group, okay? So given this data set, we have basically trained the transfer feature model on this data type. And what we got, if we measure the test error as a function of the size of the target training set, is precisely this light blue curve, okay? The orange curve instead corresponds to the uh, random feature model, the green curve to a two-layer neural network trained completely from scratch, and the blue curve, um, dark blue curve to transfer feature plus uh, uh, fine-tuning. Now, there will be many things to say about these plots and comparing all these different learning models, but at this stage of the work, we were actually interested to check whether the correlated the hidden manifold model can concretely reproduce this scenario that we are actually observe in the experiment of uh, real data sets. And to basically check this, we constructed uh, the source task as a standard uh, hidden manifold model, and the target task is basically constructed from the source task by perturbing the 30% of the feature, okay? If you with this data set, uh, you perform exactly the same experiment, so you measure once again the test error is a function of the size of the training set, you will get this behavior here. So there is a striking qualitative agreement between what we can observe with real data sets and what instead we are actually observing with Gaussian data. Now, even if there is in this case not, I mean, a numerical agreement, this qualitative agreement uh, is still there and um, actually allows us to basically start investigating and deriving di different phase diagrams for uh, basically understanding uh, transfer learning uh, effectiveness. And therefore, we actually learn something from, uh, uh, I mean, this theoretical uh, analysis with a Gaussian model that turns out to be useful for uh, deep learning application. For instance, the first thing that we learned is that uh, transfer feature model uh, exhibit a delayed interpolation threshold. So they are actually able to fit much more data, and this is simply due to the correlations that are encoded within the transfer feature map. Okay. The second thing is that transfer learning is highly asymmetric in the sense that transferring from harder to simpler tasks in terms of generalization performances is um, way better than doing the opposite. A third thing is that transfer learning uh, 
can be actually effectively, but it needs to be used wisely because it strongly depends on how much the source and the target task are actually correlated. And uh, this basically allows us to notice, uh, I mean, this de strong dependency on the, on the two correlations that basically uh, contrary to what deep learning prediction uh, typically does, that is to transfer all the features, uh, uh, all the layers of feature extractor uh, at once, it is better convenient uh, to, depending on the, on the correlations between the two data sets, uh, to transfer just small parts of the, of the network. That is why in this very last paper, we basically design an algorithm that allows to basically identify the optimal transfer depth, and also we propose uh, a strategy to select the optimal source task among all the available candidates. And all of these came from uh, a Gaussian data model. Okay, so are there any questions up to this point? Yes, please. Um, so you could measure similarity in many different ways, I presume. So I'm wondering sort of what you use here or how you measure that, does that change your qualitative you mean the... Wait, the similarity between the source and target. Task. Ah, okay. Yeah. No, uh, here actually, I, if I go back, in the data model, um, you measure the similarity between these parameters. So for instance, uh, here you see you have the teacher vector of the source task. Then you have the teacher vector of the target task, and Q is basically identifying you the, the overlap between the two teachers. So this will allow you to actually measure the correlations between the two, the two data sets. Then given these two data sets, you can actually check how this correlation propagates throughout the networks. And for that, we have some uh, more, uh, I mean, we, we use some well-defined um, similarity measure among uh, neural networks, like, for instance, information imbalance, which is a measure that uh, has been developed uh, quite recently in Alessandro Laios group. Okay. So, um, okay, so understanding basically how transfer learning works is extremely important because basically deep learning models uh, nowadays are never trained completely from scratch. And transformers do not make uh, an exception. So transformers are actually a special type of artificial uh, neural networks that are currently achieving state-of-the-art results in uh, various domains. For instance, uh, language modeling or image uh, classification. But here, the central question is, why are these network type of networks uh, uh, so special? Well, if you think about it, when we either read some uh, text or we look to a given image, we do not just blindly go through all the words or uh, through all the elements of an image, but we are also able to uh, assign them a meaning depending on the surrounding context. So, for instance, if I give you this sentence, the animal did not cross the street because it was too tired, directly from the context, you will basically realize that the pronoun it is referring to the word animal. Now, if I give you instead this other sentence, the animal did not cross the street because it was too wide, again, from the context, you will easily realize that the pronoun it is referring to the word uh, street. Now, transformers are actually very good in playing this game, that is learning uh, context and meaning from uh, sequential type of data. And uh, once again, one of the key things that uh, make their success uh, is transfer learning. Now, in the context uh, of large language models, the source task is a special type of self-supervised learning task, which is called uh, masked language modeling. This task basically consists uh, in training uh, a neural network to actually predict uh, missing words in uh, large amounts of uh, uh, raw text. And in this way, basically, the transformer is pushed to learn the interactions among the different words uh, uh, in, um, in a sentence. 
Now, this task is, of course, self-supervised because the, the labels are directly sampled from, uh, from the input. And as you can see, it's data abundant by definition because we can always take and collect huge amounts of raw text because we do not require any type of annotation. The only requirement that is asked to the user is simply to mask here and then randomly some words. Okay. Now, once the transformer has been pre-trained on uh, uh, this task, um, it can be actually fine-tuned to some downstream tasks. For instance, text generation, as in the famous example of, uh, of ChatGPT. Now, despite actually transformers uh, are widely used in deep learning uh, applications, uh, they still uh, are considered as a sort of uh, black box, box models. And indeed, one may ask, for instance, uh, what transformers actually learned when they are trained on masked language modeling tasks? Or how many samples are required to achieve good generalization performances when we train neural network models in self-supervised uh, learning mode, okay? Once again, to answer this type of question, in this paper, we basically propose the generalized POTS model as a good data model for, uh, let's say, mimicking the interactions between uh, the different words in a sentence. So how does this model work? Well, we model sentences of uh, length uh, big L as a sequences of uh, one not uh, encoded vectors. So here, the dimension C is nothing but the size of the vocabulary. So if you want the total number of different words that you have in your data set. Once you have this, each sequence is then sampled uh, from the Gibbs measure of the generalized spots uh, uh, um, uh, model, where the energetic function differ with respect to the standard POTS model, because we do not just allow interaction among the positions of the different words through the matrix J, but we also allow interaction with respect to the semantic uh, meaning of the different words. Okay? Are there any questions up to this point? Yes, please. <laughs> Hello? Yes. If you do this one-hot encoding, it seems that like the dimension C would be very large for a realistic yes. case like English or something. Yes. Right? So then would you have enough data to fit these models or something? Well, actually, what people typically do in transformers is that uh, after having done this transformation, they apply some layers of uh, embedding, which basically reduce the dimensionality. For instance, uh, from, uh, I don't know, 50,000, uh, it goes to 500. And then, actually, you also learn these metrics that performs the, the embedding. So it's really, I mean, uh, so, reduced. So roughly I should be thinking that even though one is doing this one hot encoding, like all words are not actually distinct. There are many words that are actually pretty similar. So if I project yes, it down to a exactly, space. exactly. Because then you you have first a stage of tokenization, it's called in Jergo, so where you basically construct from words token which are basically vectors uh, made of some uh, embedding uh, plus positional encoding. I mean, these are all technicalities of transformers, but yes, you can actually reduce the dimensionality in the end. Okay, so once we uh, had, uh, I mean, having this data, data model, then we construct the masked language modeling task in the framework of the generalized spots. By, uh, simply measuring, uh, by simply sampling big M sequences from the Gibbs uh, uh, distribution. And then to construct the, the data set, we basically take these sequences of one not uh, encoded uh, vectors, and we mask one one not encoded vector randomly per sequence. This defines the input of the data sets associate, associated to the masked uh, language modeling task, while the label will be the masked one not encoded uh, vector itself, okay? 
So given this data set, then the goal is again the, the usual one that is to basically train a transformers in order to be able to find a good estimate J at and U at of the true interaction matrices of your model in order to basically achieve the lowest possible generalization loss. Okay? So having defined the data model and the task, uh, what about, I mean, the first question, what transformers learns with masked language modeling? I'm not going to talk about this, but if you are interested in, Sebastian Gold is going to, to talk about it uh, during uh, his talk. What I will here focus is instead how many samples are required to achieve good generalization performances in self-supervised learning. Well, it turns out that uh, statistical physics, as we all know, uh, is extremely powerful in answering these type of questions, especially in teacher-student settings where the labels are provided by a teacher vector T. And then the goal of the student is to find a good estimate W hat of the teacher T by actually um, minimizing uh, the test loss. Okay? So, as I was saying uh, at the very beginning uh, of, the, of the talk, uh, once again, uh, the extension to include data structure in replica theory turns out to be extremely useful because we know actually how to compute this uh, test loss. Um, I mean, uh, even in context with, where data sets uh, are structured. And this actually turned out to be useful also for studying a masked language modeling task, because if we now make an assumption on our data model, so we basically make it Gaussian by relaxing the discrete nature of, uh, of the one not encoding and substituting with some real uh, variables, the masked sequences will now be sampled from a Gaussian mixture. And how basically these um, uh, words are basically connected to each other is controlled by the covariance matrix of the, of the Gaussian distribution. Now, if you make this assumption, you can actually uh, apply the whole machinery of the replica theory also in masked language modeling with the only difference that now the labels are not provided by any teacher vector, but are instead directly sampled from the input distribution itself. So the goal of the student in this case is not to infer a generic uh, teacher vector, but precisely the rows of the covariance matrix. So we can, thanks to this approximation, compute the generalization loss in masked uh, language modeling. And if you do that, what you would get is precisely this solid uh, black line here, where basically I'm displaying here the test loss as a function of the number of samples per sequence length. Now, this is what the Gaussian approximation of the generalized POTS model is giving us but we can actually run concretely some simulation on the actual data models on the generalized spots. And what we will get once again is a striking qualitative similarity between what the Gaussian data model can predict and what instead is actually observed with the, with the true data model. Are there any questions up to this point? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, because actually um, the, the appearance of the peak, that is something I'm going to discuss in very few minutes later, uh, it's basically um, due to, uh, it basically appears at the interpolation threshold. And this interpolation we actually discovered that strongly depends on the type of loss that you are using. Now, in the Gaussian data model, I was using a square loss because the uh, values are real, while uh, in the data model, uh, I mean, since uh, it's one not encoded, so are discrete variables, it should be interpreted as a classification problem. So actually, um, 
you, you are using a cross entropy loss in this case, so the interpolation threshold change. But despite that, I mean, in both cases, you actually observe the presence of this peak. And this, is, this peak um, actually is directly related to the double descent uh, phenomenon. Uh, but this time, I mean, the appearance of this peak is not due to label noise, but uh, it comes directly from the, uh, the noise that is encoded in the input data distribution because it's a self-supervised learning task, okay? And um, uh, moreover, I mean, as you can see, there is the, an absence of the initial descent. And uh, this is basically due to the, le the higher level of noise that you have in the input and that you can't control because it's uh, intrinsic of the input itself. So just to basically conclude, uh, I was basically starting with these two questions. Now the first one, we have already seen it. The second one, can we still learn something from a Gaussian data model? Well, the answer is yes, there are some machine learning settings where you can still learn something. For instance, we have seen an example in transfer learning, but also in, uh, in self-supervised uh, uh, learning. And with this, I basically conclude, and I would like to thank uh, all the people uh, involved in this project, uh, in particular Bruno and Ludovic that are here in the audience. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions? <laughs> uh, please, can you go back to the slide on task similarity? Um, this one? No. Task similarity, the second part of the talk. Um, Where you were designing it, the correlation between the high dead manifold model. Ah, sorry, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, this, yes. this one. And yes. Uh, on the source stars, you have same mu. On the targets, you also have same mu. If, for example, I decide to change, like not to use the same same mu, mm -hmm. is this meaningful? Um, I don't think so, uh, because these are basically some Gaussian random variables, so they do not provide any type of information. The structure in the input is really encoded uh, in the generative features uh, F, because it's really like uh, if you have an image, for instance, of a cat, uh, these features are basically telling you that uh, a face of a cat is made of some, uh, no, with some noise, uh, and I mean, the typical shape of the cat. And this, the shape of the cat is controlled by these features. So uh, this is what you need to uh, basically change uh, if you want to, to change the structure of your data set. Then you can also play with the intrinsic dimension of, uh, of the data set. So how much, uh, let's say, um, uh, data points are uh, spread in the lower dimensional manifold. And also you can act on the teacher because you, you could have, uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, you, you could take MNIST and divide it in even odd digits. The, the images are the same, but the task is different because you want to classify even odd uh, images. And you could take also MNIST and try to classify numbers that are greater or smaller than five. And then this is another task where again, the images are the same, but the labeling rule is different. So these are the three things that um, are basically um, important for the data structure. Okay, mm. uh, last question. On the, on the large language task, yes. can you share the intuition behind the semantic interaction? Um, yes, mm, okay, because um, basically when you have, uh, let's say, some words in a sentence, um, they occupy in this sentence uh, a particular position, okay? But the meaning that we assign to this word uh, is not just uh, uh, about the position that they basically take in, uh, in the sentence, but also the intrinsic meaning that they have. For instance, if I, in a sentence I have the word apple, I know that this is a fruit independently on the position that, uh, that it takes. And so, 
when sentences are constructed, the, what it matters is the position that the words occupy in a given sentence, but also uh, the, um, the intrinsic meaning uh, of that word, that is the image that is triggered uh, in, in your brain when you think about that word. Okay. Hi, Federica. Thank yes. you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I would like to come back to the, um, uh, this collapse of all the curves in the random label yes. setting. <laughs> I want to understand whether my intuition is correct. Uh, so in a sense, what you're doing is, uh, so, okay, when you learn, you can learn two things, if I'm not mistaken. You can learn uh, the rule linking inputs and outputs, what we usually call the teacher in this uh, yes. setups. And uh, something intrinsic to the structure of the inputs, right? Yes. So in this setting, there is no rule because you have random labels. Exactly. And by making the, by homogenizing the, the inputs by, by this standardization or this yes. uh, whitening or whatever, you are also kind of destroying the data structure. So is it really surprising that at the end everything collapses on the same curves because both aspects are kind of... Yeah, actually, I mean, you are not completely destroying it because you still have the Gaussian clouds that are found in, in a given position. What is, what is the same? It's just the, the covariance matrix. And um, actually, um, as you, I mean, can see, even if you have random labels, uh, the um, covariance matrix is, uh, needs to be the same because actually you are also, even if you have random labels, you are still learning something about the input. And so this is what uh, it was surprising because at the first glance one can say, okay, yes, but if, if you have random labels, you are not learning anything about the input data structure. Instead, this is not the case because if the covariance matrices uh, are not homogeneous, then uh, you, you start observing uh, something that deviates from, uh, from this Gaussian universality. But I mean, you still have some structure even if I agree with you that uh, it's uh, a little bit uh, less evident in this case. But one thing to say uh, that it's more uh, a further, uh, let's say, branch of the theorem is that uh, if you instead consider square loss uh, um, functions, then in this case, uh, you um, observe this Gaussian universality, so the, the collapse, even if the covariance uh, matrices uh, are no more homogeneous. So for the square loss, there is this uh, farther, uh, stronger universality, even if they are not homogeneous. For the other losses, uh, uh, this is not the case. But uh, of course, we still have to understand <laughs> so many things about this models and how they and, work. And this collapses, this universality hold in some specific scalings for the numbers of hidden units and things like this, right? So yeah, I mean, for, for the moment, we, we see that uh, it holds when the scaling is uh, linear. So you have a number of samples that scales linearly with the input dimension. Uh, I don't know very well if maybe Ludovic and Bruno did some uh, advancement uh, later to, to include uh, the, the square regime, but actually we are also start working with, um, I mean, to extend the statistical physics theory to the, to the square regime, and uh, Manfred uh, did also a, a beautiful work about that, uh, yeah, in the 80s, I think. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, my Thank question you. is that um, the Gaussian data model, is it, um, can we use it for image classification in, in the sense of, in the sense of uh, uh, breast cancer problem, like in medical, um, medical field, for example? Because I can see the example you gave there uh, just based on the yeah. MINIST fashion data set. Yeah, um, that would be cool. Uh, and indeed, um, I have some medical uh, data at disposal. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the future direction uh, that I typically um, 
present uh, when I talk about this transfer learning work is precisely to try to apply what we have basically observed with Gaussian data models to medical imaging. But actually, we, um, we have already done this in this paper but with the toy medical imaging, so the one that you could uh, download on, uh, on Kaggle. Um, sorry, it's here. So in this paper, we have actually applied uh, this algorithm to medical datasets. Um, starting from uh, a previous analysis on uh, Gaussian data models, uh, and we actually observe uh, once again the same uh, behavior, that is that the optimal transfer depth is found in, in a non-trivial position. But I personally also would like to um, try also with other medical data sets that are not downloaded on Kaggle and which are real one, that, the, the one that you actually collect uh, during uh, experimental, uh, let's say, projects. The reason why I ask the question is that, like in that domain, we you know it involves uh, like um, feature extraction, like um, feature selection, and things like that. The dimensionality of the data is very wide. In terms yes. of, I don't know if such uh, the data model, Gaussian data model, will be able to handle that problem because uh, well, because I'm currently working on that area. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, of course I'm not saying that uh, Gaussian data models works uh, in every, um, I mean, for every context. But still, you can learn something from uh, from them. And for instance, uh, in this case, in this list, this is what we what we learn. Then. Of course, if you are interested in particular things, then it could be that they do not say anything because maybe the model is too much simple. But in this case, uh, it worked. <laughs> After the talk, I will show you what I'm trying. So. Sure, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, so yeah, in the interest of time, maybe let's uh, move the re remaining questions to coffee time and then uh, we reconvene at 10.50. Uh, let's thank Federica again for the really great talk. Thank you very much.